And here you go. Okay, so a, just a couple of things before we get started with this second uh, session. Let's go and see first a couple of questions that I want to make sure are covered before we start with, uh, or we continue, let's say, with the uh, shopping cart that I had created before our break. One of the questions that students are asking a lot about, if you're not that familiar with Teams, besides the chat that we're using here to talk and the meeting that we're using to, to, to meet virtually like we're doing right now, you have an icon here called uh, Teams. And if you click on this icon uh, under your Teams application, you have a channel called Source to Acquire LPE Training that you've been added as a member to. In this Source to Acquire channel, we're making sure we share all the recordings of every sessions for day one, for day two, even the group where the, all the recordings are uh, loaded actually at the end. Uh, any information, for example, if I go to the files tab here, you can also find the uh, PPTs that we've been sharing. Uh, I think uh, if we haven't put them all there, we will, but eventually this channel is something that will remain open for you to keep sharing ideas and keep sharing information that you guys are actually sharing on the chat right now, which is the one that we're using. Another thing is the forms that uh, the forms application that we're using for surveys and polling questions and how to access that. Usually if you're using Teams, you should have access to all the applications that Teams, I guess, works with, right? If, for example, I go here to my apps icon here to the uh, left and I simply write forms, I should have access to this application forms. And in my case, it's already downloaded and active. All I have to do is open it if I want to use it. <clears throat> but basically, for those of you who don't have access to the forms yet or are having trouble accessing uh, our forms, for example, when I go into any of the uh, Microsoft applications and I click on this icon here that looks like a uh, sort of a waffle, if I click on it, you have all the applications that are linked to Microsoft. Uh, OneDrive, OneNote, PowerPoint, and so on. You have Stream, where our videos are, and even Forms. And I simply click on Forms to create my own uh, forms and surveys. If you have this application open and active, once you click on the link that we share in the chat, you'll have access, direct access to the forms that we are uh, sending to you. See, the one we sent this morning basically is this one with our 42 responses. And you should have access to this no problem. I know sometimes there's an issue with the loading, but this has nothing to do with either being <clears throat> invited or not to this training. Everyone that's part of this session should be invited and should also be a member in the channel. If I'm looking at the channel here and I click on the members, if I want to manage the team, I see that we have the owners, which is the trainers here, but then the members and guests, we have added up to 48 people and that's all of you are added here as members and that's why you have access to the training to the chat to the channel and all the information that we share through there just a quick uh, brief overview of how teams works and and where you can get information from even though we do send you materials through email we make sure we share it in the chat which is actually if i click on this one here this is our chat okay where daniel has just shared here uh forms <clears throat> and then you have the channel itself which is the channel for the entire training you won't see the chat information here but you will see the links to the recordings and we can keep using this uh, forever and ever this will not be closed you can always go back to it and keep adding information to this channel uh, every time you have an update on something you would like to share information <clears throat> the other thing is the uh, stream channel right i put this link in the uh, channel here for source to acquire if you guys uh, click on this link, I believe, but just clicking on this link, it'll open up directly the group for Source to Acquire on Stream, where we have all the videos that we're sharing. So if you just click on that link, you'll have access to the videos from yesterday, the one in the morning session and the one in the afternoon session. And that's where you're also going to find every other recording that we do throughout the week. It's just a quick reminder of that and maybe we can go back to that uh, later on but let's uh, get to it and before i send the new uh polling question again for the afternoon session let me just go over what we did this morning and recuperate my uh, shopping cart so remember we were and for those of you who couldn't join the morning session are now joining the afternoon session we raised the shopping cart for goods that uh, where the shop where the goods were actually going to be received into inventory. What we learned about and we focused on during the morning session 
was not only the fields that are required in order to integrate with inventory. So for example, the purchasing group, the plant, the storage location, uh, the delivery address, the correct product ID from the contract catalog, also the order as direct material checkbox to check it or not in the difference that made, especially if we're talking about uh, fixed assets and what uh, difference that made. We can go over that if there are more questions, but I just want to keep going to at least make sure that we cover what we wanted to cover during this session and before we jump into BI. Okay, so where we left off is we had our shopping cart here and uh, I simply uh, clicked on it. Uh, I think in this particular case, I logged in. I'm still logged in as the, uh, not the buyer. I don't think so. Let me just make sure I logged in properly. So I'm going to go back and double click here on the portal and I'm going to log in as the buyer. And what we were pending to see before we went on lunch is, uh, first of all, to see if actually we had, uh, I think I already had the portal open here, and I am logged in as the buyer here. Okay, perfect. So what we were pending to see was if this shopping cart, one of the line items we left empty and we said that the Inco terms was going to, uh, were going to derive into the PO once we logged in as buyers. And we were going to check that uh, first thing. So this is the shopping cart that we had. We're clicking on it and we're making that uh, available here. Okay. And we have our shopping cart. We're looking at our details. Okay. And we're going to go through to our related documents here and see that we have already a PO created linked to our shopping carts. Let's click on that one and let's view the PO as if we were buyers in this particular case. Remember the responsibility of the buyers to ensure that the Incoterm field is correct and that Incoterm field should derive from the contract, from the product ID in the contract that we selected. Uh, besides the fact that, of course, the buyer should monitor and track and see if the correct product IDs have been added, if the correct details in terms of account assignment are added as well, uh, any other piece of information or integrating detail that uh, the requisitioner may have missed when creating uh, the shopping cart. Okay, that's the responsibility here. And one of the first things we wanted to do was check and see if the Incoterm key location had derived. Remember our first item, our forklift here, was uh, we had written manually the XWorks Incoterm here uh, with Yokohama port. Uh, for the second item, if I'm not mistaken, we had our DAP. But for the third item, we hadn't written anything because we said that the best practice for a requisition is to leave the field blank and let it derive once the PO is created because that's the responsibility of the buyer, right? That's when we were talking about the integration with TM, raising a shopping cart for goods and the integration with TM. Again, also a reminder that we're only raising a shopping cart for goods and we're not adding the line for freight, okay? Especially for those uh, product IDs that we're selecting from a contract that is going to require a freight forwarder to transport our goods. If we're selecting product IDs with a DAP include term, the services for transportation or the freight services are already included in that product ID. So you see our last item here, details for item three, we have the Inco term key and location derived. So FCA Durban port has actually derived without us adding any information in the shopping cart. And maybe we can, if I make this uh, smaller, I can go back to my shopping cart, which I have here, go back to my item data and prove that, right? So our first line here was the, um, Hold on, sorry, let me go up. And here we go, we have our item one, XWorks Yokohama port, our item two, we should have now DAP unmiss, and our item three should be blank in the shopping cart, and it is, all right? But if we look at the PO, our item three has actually derived the Inco term as we were stating before. So even in the training environment, it works properly. So at this point is where the buyer would check this to make any changes if they had to make any changes. Okay, so since everything is correct and for the sake of time, we're going to move forward. What I want to show you guys now is uh, let's say that everything is correct at this point with the uh, PO and we're going to order it and we're going to generate the inbound delivery documents, right? And we're also going to, we had a pre-commitment before with the shopping cart. Now we're committing uh, also in um, impacting the FM module as well. And here we go. We have our uh, PO now that is ordered. 
and we can close this and make sure we log in now as the approver also for uh, the PO and go into ECC quickly and check for the inbound deliveries that have been generated. And now what we want to check with the inbound deliveries is two things. One, that we have at least three different inbound deliveries generated because remember each line item had a different inco term. Okay, line item three here has the inco term FCA while line item two had the DAP inco term and line item one had the XWorks inco term. So each inco term is going to generate a different inbound delivery and we just want to make sure that that is the case. Okay, so let's close this and I'm going to go with the questions in a second. Let me just go through these few steps because I'm sure there are questions already, especially for those of you who did not join the morning session may have tons of questions. Of course, we're not going to repeat everything exactly, but we do want to make sure that the main points are clear. Let me just log out quickly and log in again as the approver for my last step. Then the inbound delivery document should be generated. Okay, and our password here. Okay, so we're going to look for our shopping cart. Uh, in this case, we're going to look for our, we could actually look for our PO directly, but let's work with our shopping cart here. Okay, we have it uh, selected, or maybe we can just do it a quicker way and go with the PO instead, um, since I have the number as well. Let's get rid of the dates here, and we can simply write our purchase order number for the sake of time here. And if there are no other fields populated, we should have our uh, PO directly here. Okay, again, we can just click on it. Of course, there's different ways of approving and so on, but uh, and there's different ways to do uh, many things. But in this particular case, okay, so we have an open task. Let's just make sure that we finish the approval and process this PO. Okay. We'll approve it, and now what we'll do is jump into ECC and take a look at our inbound delivery documents that have been generated. If by any chance they haven't been generated, we can generate them ourselves. If uh, we have any other issues, I created a couple of them yesterday, so we have inbound deliveries that are generated for item for shopping carts that are identical to this one. I did those yesterday just in case anything went wrong at this point. Okay, so quick review. We raised the shopping cart. We have three fixed assets. We selected these fixed assets from an established contract. Each one of these fixed assets has a different inco term. So now we're going to see that the fact that these inco terms are generating three different inbound delivery documents. And we learned that when we're raising a shopping cart for fixed assets, the um, checkbox for order as direct material was not clicked, was not selected because by clicking on that checkbox, you're automatically defaulting the shopping cart to provide you with some fields versus other fields. If we do not check the box of order as material, we have the option to select asset uh, under the account assignment and be able to generate our uh, asset uh, shell, right? Our asset record. And that's why we do not check the box for order as direct material, even though we are ordering these goods and are receiving them into inventory. Since we're talking about fixed assets, we don't do that. If we were raising a shopping cart for other pieces of equipment or expendables that are going to be received into inventory, we would check the box for order as direct material. For this particular case, we didn't. And we only used fixed assets because we know that that's what worked in our training environment and we wanted to make sure that our demo worked successfully for you. Hopefully, that was clear, just a quick review. Now we can log out of SRM and we'll dive in now to ECC and take a quick look at our inbound delivery document. Uh, Brian? Yep. Just, um, I was uh, responding to some of the questions and comments in the chat. Um, now that I'm taking this opportunity while you are logging into ECC now, and uh, specifically to the inbound delivery document, uh, well, there's a bit of a, <clears throat> Some comments in related to the TM versus uh, inbound delivery document, who is updating that uh, inbound, inbound delivery document with the mm -hmm. date. I already posted there uh, we, what we have already discussed all these days, you know, that uh, the inbound coordinator is the person responsible. Uh, nonetheless, the TM module has a say on that, right? 
and uh, currently the situation it's uh, well um, the TM module may uh, take over that part of the updating the status of the delivery at some point but um, I don't know while you're doing I don't know if you have a Anything to say about that? Uh, they are explaining. They are uh, asking whether you can force to create the inbound deli delivery uh, document as well. I did already share the VL34 t, uh, t code. Mm -hmm. so, uh, <clears throat> TM module. Sorry for that. The acronym uh, it's transportation management module. So uh, because uh, we just had a question from Raluca. TM equals to transportation management module. So over to you, Brian, for the inbound and the TM part. Thanks. OK, thanks, Daniel. Yeah, the uh, first of all, in terms of uh, TM, for those that are joining in, we were discussing this morning. We wanted to, or at least it was part of the design matrix for this uh, training, is to uh, inform you of the impact of this module called transportation management. Now, the peacekeeping missions have gone live with transportation management already in December. OK, this past December 2019, but it is true that not all entities have gone live with TM. Now, it is important that we uh, mention the impact of raising a shopping cart in the proper uh, fields that need to be populated in the proper um, process to raise a shopping cart for goods, considering TM, even though it's not live yet, because some of the aspects of it are critical. And one of them was the fact that we're not adding a line for freight in the shopping cart for goods, right? So we were discussing about this transportation ma management module and how it's affecting SRM. That's why we felt the need to incorporate that. Every other piece of information that we've shared is the process as usual when raising a shopping cart for inventory, right? with the goods, whether you're adding the purchasing group, whether you're adding the plant, the storage location, the delivery date, the account assignment information, that has always been a key to raising a proper shopping cart, even selecting the product ID from a, an established contract. So uh, from there, there was really nothing new. We just mentioned a couple of fields that also had an impact in the TM module. Now, in terms of roles and who's doing what, ever since the TM module has also been implemented, people People from MoveCon are debating as if they have to also go in and now update the inbound delivery document. Now, we know that every mission and every entity will do things differently, and some people will have more than one role and will have to do several things. But the inbound coordinator is still the person uh, responsible for updating the inbound delivery document. Okay, that still remains the same. Now, TM is more uh, launched for planners, and those planners that will receive the role of planners will probably impact the MoveCom people mostly and not uh, other group of people. But we don't want to spend too much time talking about TM. We just wanted to mention the impact of the transactions in a shopping cart and how they impact other modules as well as inventory management. But in terms of who does what, the inbound coordinator should still update the inbound delivery document. Okay, so I hope uh, the quick summary clarifies that. I know it's a lot. We spent two hours in the morning talking about that, and now I'm summarizing it in, in three minutes. I recommend also to watch the recording, and if anything we talk about now is not clear, we can we can uh, review that before I hand the floor to Daniel and BI, okay? So what I'm doing now as I move on, unless there's anything else, Daniel, and while I log in, maybe we can look at that. I'm going to log into ECC and look for my inbounds, OK? Mm -hmm. And well, yeah, there are some, some debate here in the chat on when the inbound delivery document is created, uh, whether uh, when you order um, uh, an LVA or a PO, it's the same that approving an LVA or a PO. So if you can just uh, elaborate on that, or I can just chip in, whatever. <clears throat> so when when ordering an LVA or a PO, it's the same thing. Sorry, I didn't understand that one. Yeah, whether uh, ordering and approving an PO is the same thing. Oh, okay. So what I was just doing uh, before an SRM, meaning clicking on the button that is called order, and then Make the approval. Okay. Yeah. So the ordering would be the basically creating the PO, right? So approving the or, or verifying the shopping cart and generating that PO item and saying it's okay, while the approving part that I did last will be approving any changes that I've made into the, the PO. So the buttons, uh, when the buyer is reviewing the PO after the approval of the shopping cart, I think the button there is called order versus the one where the uh, approver comes in, it's called um, <clears throat> uh, 
sorry, uh, the first one is called order and the next one is called uh, approval. But that's the only difference. I think that's what you're referring to, right? The, the names of the buttons, depending on what you're doing. Exactly. Yep. Okay, so once uh, the buyer has ordered this PO and this PO has now been approved by the approver, we now have generated these inbound delivery uh, documents that we're looking for right now. And that's what we're doing in ECC. We're going to ECC to look for these inbound deliveries that should have been generated already. And we were talking about the fact that we're looking for at least three, right? We should have at least three because we have three different inco terms, one per line item, and that should generate <clears throat> in different inbound delivery documents. So we're gonna check for that now. They probably haven't been generated yet because it takes some time to generate. I'm looking for this based on my PO. I'm going to remove all my delivery dates here. So I basically just tell the system that I want to search for this particular PO. Of course, we can always do it based on dates as well. But if I click on this uh, PO number here and I search for it, now I may have something already or may not. Uh, the most logical thing is that I won't. See, in this case, it says nothing. So we can always go by and generate them ourselves, right? With the TCO that Daniel, I think, was posting in the chat. So let's do that. VL34 will allow us to uh, generate these, uh, these inbound deliveries. So the plant that we were using, correct? I, if I'm not mistaken, we were using SS10, uh, and also the storage location was 3104. Hopefully my memory does not uh, fail me here. And the delivery date, we said it was today. So we can run this under test run to see what the system is telling us, if there's anything pending for this plant in this storage location. And if there are items, then maybe we can run this without the test run. Okay, this shouldn't take too long because there should only be three. And yes, the simulation result has three inbound deliveries determined for this plant, this storage location for this date. And now what I can do is remove this test run and just execute this T code now without the test run. And that should now force the generation of my inbound delivery documents. And I should be able to access them uh, now with the T code I was using before, VL06i. Okay, so we have uh, three inbounds that have been generated and saved, 6970 and 71. Uh, don't seem to have any error messages here. So I think we should be okay with that. Let's go now and see VL06i. Let's take a look at the uh, list of inbound deliveries that uh, were generated now that I forced onto the system here with the same PO uh, document number here. And let's see now we should have at least three with the three different inco terms uh, in the uh, system. Uh -huh. Just to um, um, identify what you just did, you removed the dates, right? And you only put the, the PO created. Exactly, yes. So I went here just to, for the sake of speeding things up and not having a long list of uh, inbounds. I removed these dates uh, when they were created on. I could always just also work with the date of today, right? and just look for inbounds that were created today and maybe not add any PO information. If I just wanted to search uh, through a range of, of POs that were generated, I could do that, just use the dates, but I took them out and just put my PO document number up top. The same thing I can do with the, <clears throat> sorry, I'm clearing my throat a lot today. Uh, the inbound delivery document can be added to the bottom uh, field as well here if we don't know the PO number. And then, there, of course, there are more uh, fields that we can fill in in order to pull all the inbounds that were generated or that could be generated based on certain information. So I'm going to execute that report now only using the date 19 of May, which is today. And I should still only have three inbound delivery documents. But if more people may be using this training environment, more people may be generating, but no. See, in this case, we still have our same three uh, POs ending in 302. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, sometimes, yes, I'm, I'm running through it thinking that it's very basic at some times, but if, if uh, you guys want me to clarify what I'm doing, I'll it, step back and do it again. I, I mean, I, uh, I did it on purpose because I think this is the first time we are logging in into ECC, and uh, maybe it might be the first time or some of our students might not be very familiar with the, with the ECC module, just, just in case. Thanks. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> so exactly once we have created our shopping cart and POs and SRM, it automatically generates a documentation in ECC. This documentation is the inbound delivery document, which is the document that before TM or even during TM, the transportation management module that we're talking about, was the document that was constantly being updated and the document where documents were constantly being attached uh, depending on updates in terms of the transportation of the goods, right? If we had a bill of lading, we were adding it to the inbound delivery document. If uh, the freight forwarder a PO number was there, we were adding it to the inbound delivery document and any other type of legal document that you can think of that we were adding to the inbound before. Now this inbound is also generating documents in the transportation module and they're all interconnected. That's why it's important from the beginning, from the shopping cart level, to ensure that we have those elements like the purchasing group, the plant, the storage location, the delivery address that are all accurate so that it doesn't only have an impact in ECC and we have the documents there generated accurately, but also in TM. That's why it's important all the way from the beginning. The responsibility of the requisitioner from point one and the buyer from point one is uh, quite big, okay, through the downstream processes. I don't know if that's uh, still you, uh, Daniel, and there's something else to add. I I'm hear sorry. keyboarding. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was responding and, and okay. I got no to mute. Sorry. No problem at all. Okay. So here we go. We have our three inbounds and they're linked to our POs. Okay, we have our three different inco term locations here and the dates and the vendor that we've selected from the contract. And if we access one of these inbounds, so I'm just going to double click on one of these inbound documents, the one for XWorks in Yokohama port. And now because of TM, and that's why it's important that we're mentioning TM, because when you start using the system now, you'll see new things, new uh, different tabs or, or fields that you didn't have before. For example, here, if we're looking at an inbound delivery document, for those of you who usually work with these, you, you may realize that there's something new already on this screen, and it's your TM status tab, the one that I'm hovering over right now. This TM status tab is now added to the inbound delivery document, and it can be accessed, maybe not from this training environment particularly because it's, it's a broken link, but I'll show you that right now really quickly through another environment, and sorry for the jumping back and forth, but I wanted to show you how my shopping cart created an SRM and the PO created an SRM, generated inbounds that in a sense generated a TM status tab that will generate documents in TM and it's all linked together. This was the best way to show you. This new TM status tab now will allow users to access the document flow of this inbound delivery document and view the items that are generated also in TM and that will follow up through if we were, for example, a TM planner uh, from uh, the MoveCon group, for example, in a mission or an entity. So this is the brand new tab in the inbound delivery document and the document flow button that will display the TM documents that are linked to this inbound. Okay, that's very important. Now, before we do anything else, another very important aspect of the of uh, TM integration is the packing. Now, packing has always happened, okay, uh, with the inbound delivery documents. The vendor usually provides the inbound coordinators with the, the packaging details, and these details are usually added to the inbound delivery document. Okay, by simply clicking on the packing icon here, which we will leave this for Friday because I think today we have enough information. We'll leave this part for Friday. We would pack the items according to what the vendor is telling us, right? Usually the packing occurs a lot more during STOs and STRs and so on because uh, the, the UN staff members are responsible for how items are packaged. But even when it's vendor purchase goods, we need to, uh, let's say, identify the packaging materials used by the vendor the way that it's instructed by the vendor and that will also have a downstream impact into tm and we'll see that on friday okay right now i just wanted to show you the inbound delivery documents that were generated from our transactions this morning and now how each one of these inbound delivery documents has a new tab called the tm status tab that will link everything that happens in ecc and an srm with tm in terms of shopping cart, PO, uh, and every other integration field that we added this morning. Okay, that's what needs to be 
clear. And that was my last portion for this afternoon's session. Now I'm going to quickly log out of this environment just to show you guys what those documents would look like, because I think it's also very important that you guys take a look at what these documents look like here. And let me go now to the training environment, T5E, and show you uh, an inbound delivery document that does have here the documents generated. Hold on, I'm writing the wrong password there. Okay, and let's go again. I'm writing VL06I. So I'm doing exactly the same process as I was showing you in the other environment, but now I'm going to run. Uh, I'm going to run a, a new search, or maybe I can just search by uh, inbound deliveries if I wanted to, just to show you guys the inbound deliveries that I know worked because I was looking at them before as well. So this, at this point, I'm just going to go directly to the inbound delivery here, and I'm going to add three different inbound delivery document numbers just to show you guys what it looks like, okay, and the impact of what we do in SRM and ECC and in TM, okay, and how the downstream processes affect all the systems. So 78936 uh, is my other inbound. I'm just gonna run this report with these three inbound delivery documents. I'm gonna execute this. And when we have our inbound delivery documents here, see, it's just like we're looking at before, right? Now I'm gonna double click on the first one and I want to show you the TM status tab for this one that I know this one works. Okay, and here we go. I'm going to click on the TM status tab and here's our line and I'm going to click on the document flow uh, button here. If we look at this, and for those of you who deal with inbound delivery documents more often, if you realize now the inbound delivery document is automatically linked to a series of documents, of new documents that are TM integrated. Right, one called DTR, uh, one called freight unit, one called freight order. Now I'm not going to get into what each one of these means, but I do want to show you the impact of one thing with the other. Okay, so these these are three modules that uh, have an impact with each other, right? So whatever we do in the shopping cart is going to impact the inbound and ECC, and is in its sense going to impact also TM documentation. Okay, and these are the documents we'll use in TM to track the goods that are being transported. Right now we have our inbound delivery here and the packing details I can sense that haven't been added to this inbound delivery because this packing view button is not accessible. Once the packing is done correctly, this one will be available. We'll check that on Friday. Okay, we'll spend some time on Friday with that. Okay, so that's what I wanted to go over in the first 30 to 40 minutes of the afternoon session. Uh, before I close um, the the my part of the session this afternoon, any more questions on this? Maybe not. Yeah. Okay. Daniel. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Can I ask? Sure thing. Sure. Go on, please. I maybe I lost uh, and didn't hear. I didn't understand um, when we uh, the purchase order uh, create uh, approved. It uh, it's automatically create uh, inbound delivery. Uh, so my question: Why we should to uh, create now inbound delivery? I didn't understand this. Sorry. Oh, okay, Thank okay. You. I see what you mean. Okay, so we we didn't necessarily create an inbound delivery. The system will create it automatically, but it takes some time to generate it. Sometimes it's an hour, sometimes it's two hours, sometimes it does it right away. So what we did with the system, we kind of forced the system to produce it right away. That's the only thing we did. Okay, that's just a, a trick for us to force the system to, to generate it. But the inbound was gonna be generated regardless. We didn't have to do anything. I just did it so that you guys would see the inbound uh, before the end of this afternoon session. If not, we could have been waiting here for an hour or more. That's the only thing we did. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All right, so I'm going to close this ECC session. Hopefully it was clear for those of you who joined in the morning session. Things are maybe even clearer because we did go through step by step the uh, presentation, the creation of the shopping cart. We went over the shopping cart main errors. I'm also going to share with you this PowerPoint here, which is the um, integration session, but raising a shopping cart for freight 
Okay, uh, basically it's the same instructions as we saw before, but in this case, we're only reminding you that the shopping cart for freight is raised besides the shopping cart for goods and that the document that we're going to be focusing on and we're going to have to be attaching is the SOW document. But that is something that uh, when the TM uh, module goes live for your entity, I'm sure there will be another training and it's something that we can spend time and have another training with you and explain this step by step. Nonetheless, I want to share this information with you guys. So you can already start becoming familiar with this, the impact of TM in, in raising a shopping cart, but I don't want you to, to get more confused with already enough data that we've shared with you so far. The only thing you should remember is that the line uh, item for freight is not added in the shopping cart for goods. You now raise a separate shopping cart for freight and you attach the SOW document, which is the statement of work document, which is a document generated in TM that now has all the estimated charges of the goods that we are transporting, which also helps the uh, freight procurement group to uh, understand better uh, what the prices are estimated to be and also have a better solicitation process and a better criteria in terms of choosing the best uh, bid for the uh, freight services. Okay, that's the last thing I want to say. I'm going to share the polling questions from this morning again so we see if we've uh, gotten any better. But before that, if there's any questions, now is the time to ask. In the meantime, I'll open up my polling questions and I'll just make sure I have it ready to paste in the uh, chat. Anything else from your side? Do I have a sample of the SOW? I, I do. <laughs> I do have a sample of the SOW. And you know what? Uh, let me uh, share the, uh, the polling questions in the chat. While you guys are answering them again, I'm going to quickly run into TM, grab a sample of SOW, and show it to you guys. Okay? So I'll do that. But in the meantime, maybe the best thing is to go through the polling questions first. All right? So I'm adding the link in the chat right now and while you guys take five minutes to uh, again retake these polling questions from the morning session i'm going to run in log in now into tm and and pull out a um a, an sow document so you guys can take a look at it
Okay, let's see how <clears throat> you're doing with the polling questions. Over here. Okay, 30 questions so far. Very good. Not bad, and I see that there are still, uh, okay, s big changes from this morning, but still some, uh, some of you are undecided about the uh, correct uh, option. Okay, this may also be those that are joining in only in the afternoon session and haven't uh, been to the morning session. Okay, 34 responses. Very nice. Okay, in the meantime, and uh, quickly, I'll show you guys what the... Um, SOW document looks like. Now, I don't want to spend much time on it. I'm only showing you guys so you have a, a look at uh, what we're talking about in terms of uh, what is an SOW document, but I don't want to get into the details of it. I'm just going to preview it here. Again, I'm in the TM module. Uh, it's a completely new uh, beast to, uh, to tame now. I don't want to jump into that, but here, I'll just show you guys a sample of the statement of work. But first, let's go uh, through the questions here. Okay, responses, 35, I think we're okay. And Daniel, I don't want to take uh, too much more time, so let's go quickly over these uh, questions here, and then uh, I'll show you guys the SOW document and what it looks like, okay? So our first question, and we have, again, uh, it's... 29 false, 6 true. Our first question is, a line item for freight services is required when raising a shopping cart for goods. Okay, so when we're raising a shopping cart for goods, the line item for freight services is no longer required in that shopping cart for goods. There is a separate shopping cart for freight services that is raised. Okay, the shopping cart for freight services has to be created separately, and we have to now... Uh, attached to this shopping cart for freight, the SOW document that is the one that we were displaying, I believe, uh, here. I'm not sure if it's disappearing or we have it on the screen. Let me just make sure if it's not hiding. Here we go. Okay, this is the statement of work document that we have to attach to the shopping cart for freight. The one that links the PO to the inbound in all the freight orders that are created in TM. And it basically has the basic instructions of the goods that are being transported, the um, dimension, volume, and weight estimated charges also of the goods based on the goods value that were um, added in the shopping cart or actually uh, defaulted in the shopping cart thanks to the product ID that we selected based on the contract. And it has very basic instructions as to the uh, also the vendor assigned to it and the origin location and the destination location, okay, of where these goods are being received. So if I'm not mistaken, this uh, may be a um, XWorks Inco term. I'm not sure. I just went for the first one that I had here, and I'm not sure if it's done correctly, but I wanted to show you guys at least what it looked like. It's very basic in terms of uh, instructions, okay? Also, maybe I can show you guys the... Uh, SOW form, the longer version of the form, and maybe that has more details because that the one that I'm showing you doesn't seem to have too much. Okay, but it's a basic information on, see, this is a DAT INCO term telling you where it's coming from, where it's going, basically the quantity of items transported, the goods value, the dimensions, weight, and volume of the goods being transported, and any uh, relevant notes that you may want to add to this document can be added offline, okay? So this is what it looks like, and this is the document that should be attached to your shopping cart for freight. Okay, just quickly going through this because I've been uh, requested to show a sample of the SOW document, and here you are. I think that more details on this, we'll leave that for a workshop on TM, okay? Let's go now back to our polling questions here. We already figured out that the first one is actually uh, false because we don't need the line item in the shopping cart for goods. Second one, which of the following integrates SRM with transportation module? And we have all of the above, 29, okay, the, the big winner there. Okay, remember, vendor, purchasing group, inco term, and delivery date are four of the seven integration fields with the transportation module, okay? We also had the delivery address that we had to add there as well. And we also had the um, uh, delivery, uh, no, the storage location and the plant. Okay, but here we just had some of them. So 
Of course, it's the inquo term, but of course, it's the purchasing group. Remember, purchasing group will link to the planner group in TM. The vendor, of course, will be the origin uh, location of where the goods are transported from. So it's also uh, necessary. But again, all these fields were added regardless of having the TM module exist or not. These fields were already there uh, from the start. Next point, when selecting checkbox orders direct material, what are we doing? We are ensuring we purchase materials and not services. Okay, that's not true. We are indicating that the goods in the shopping cart are purchased for consumption. Okay, we are creating the asset master record or we are indicating that the goods are purchased for inventory. So remember, if we select the checkbox, goods are purchased for inventory. If we leave it unchecked, it's for consumption, except if we're talking about fixed assets. If we're talking about fixed assets, you leave the checkbox empty because that will default a series of fields that will allow us to generate the asset master record in the shopping cart. Next one, number four, PIDs derive incoterm data from the contract catalog selected. We actually saw that this was true. We even tested it. So if I select a product ID from a contract catalog that has an FCA incoterm, by selecting that product ID, even if I don't add the inco term in the shopping cart, that inco term will automatically appear, derive, or default once the buyer goes into the PO and checks right the data that is added. You saw that the uh, inco term from my last line was added automatically without me having to add it. So PIDs derive inco term data, true. Okay, so false, no, it's the true answer here. And last but not least, the SOW document, the one we were just looking at right now. So it's to be attached to the shopping cart for freight. Yes. It contains the weight, volume, and dimensions of the goods being transported. Yes. And it will help procurement and writing the TORs for solicitation. Yes. So all the above is the correct answer. Okay. All of these are the correct answer for the statement of work. Okay, so it looks better than this morning's. Again, I know that some of you are joining in this session right now. It's your first session of the day, and you've been, uh, you've found yourself with all this new uh, TM integration fields and so on summarized in 40 minutes. Again, I recommend watching the uh, the recording. I recommend looking at the PowerPoints. We want to jump in now to BI uh, with Daniel, but if there's any last minute questions, let's go through them first. Hi, Brian. Uh, well, Grace is asking about the prices of the statement of, statement of work. Uh, that's one request from vendor in advance. So those prices has to be requested from the vendor in advance or they are already included in the SOV. OK, and the SOW, I guess. SOW. Uh, right. So th this, uh, the SOW, the, the prices or the quantities that you see there, are basically the value of the goods that were selected in the shopping cart. So really the SOW document, all it's showing is the value of the goods that was already determined from the shopping cart uh, portion and also the weight, volume and dimensions of the goods. So in a sense, you're not really telling uh, the, um, the freight forwarder uh, the cost of the transportation, okay? The, the prices that you see there have derived automatically from the selection of the PID in the contract that we selected from the shopping cart point. Okay, those are the charges that you see there. Nothing more. And if we're talking about before, because since you mentioned this OW document, I'm thinking the end of the process. If we're talking about the beginning of the process, meaning going through solicitation, creating a contract, you know, going through the bids before even raising a, a shopping cart, based on a contract, that's a different story. I'm talking about the uh, SOW and the shopping cart for freight. Okay, I think that that question is answered. Um, just let me know if there's any more to clarify there. No, and, no. Uh, also, okay, thank you. Thanks, Daniel. And also, Jawad, thank you for that uh, Comment there, very good. Okay, exactly right. So if we're selecting a product ID from a, a contract that has a DAP inco term, automatically the charges are included in that product ID. 
All right, so that's it from my side. Uh, Daniel, if you're ready, we can go with your side of the presentation. Sure, thank you. I didn't dare to stop you because I know that's your baby, TM, and you get excited with it. So <laughs> I, uh, leave you I was holding my horses today uh -huh. on that one. <laughs> now, TM is important, but uh, eventually, and for the ones of you, uh, because we had so many comments in the chat during the whole day, mm -hmm. uh, well, might not be deployed in your entity for the moment, but um, if you already are aware of the integration points, if you are already aware of the basics, and um, the creation of the shopping cart mm, in the TM part as well. So I think it's uh, you're good to go when the module is deployed in your entity. And uh, it will be deployed in from now, if I'm not mistaken, within the next 12 months. That's the, the idea. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's good information for you to to keep on, on, on hand or handy in case that TM is not being deployed in your entity. Exactly. Thanks, uh, Daniel. So whenever you're ready, let me know and I can sure. uh, stop sharing my screen. OK, I'll take over now. And uh, we do have a little bit more than one hour, but uh, uh, as uh, we uh, usually are uh, doing the reporting side of the source to acquire type of uh, workshop, uh, as this is not a workshop uh, devoted for reporting, um we don't want to uh give you a, a lot of demos and exercises and reporting that may take uh, a lot of your time and uh on top of that we may understand that uh, some of you are not quite familiar with the bi module neither so we want to take it easy and uh with uh, one hour for the analysis workspace and requisition is requisition is more than enough and uh the idea is to as we always do to uh just uh, shoot this, uh, it's not polling questions, it's a bit of a survey. Um, I want to put it in the in the chat. So uh, we are aware of uh, your knowledge in terms of uh, BI requisitioning. So uh, let's, uh, if you have uh, just two, three minutes, please go through the survey and then around uh, three, if it is okay, seven minutes from now, I will start in the, the session on BI for 60 minutes, right? So uh, in these seven minutes up until 3 p.m. In, in Valencia, you can fill in the survey and then take a break, okay? So I will resume the session in seven minutes. Thank you.
Okay. Okay. Thank you for coming back to the to the session. Um, I was going quickly through the responses, and as you can see in the in the results that we have gotten, uh, well, uh, we have a variety of responses in in how often you guys work in Mojo API. Uh, anything less than um, let's see a week or day that would mean that you are not a not i'm not saying an advanced user but a regular user so as you can see 12 it's 22 26 so it's more than three quarters uh, will not be very familiar with the uh, with the tool uh, the prompt 50 percent of you uh more or less do not know uh what a prompt how the prompt works in terms of the familiarity, familiarity in the creation of visuals or graphs in, in the reports, most of you uh, do not know. And uh, at the end, the average rate of uh, the number of the rating your experience using the requisitions analysis area in Mojo BI is three out of 10. So, uh, OK, we'll take it easy for the first uh, round. And uh, I leave uh, the comments and uh, the questions uh, to you, um, Brian, right? And in case that you want to chip in, because I know that you know about uh, BI, you are most welcome as well. So uh, let me go back to the presentation. And uh, just, uh, uh, it will basically, we'll go into the system, but I want you guys to have uh, a visual of the main uh, concepts and features of the requisitions analysis area. Uh, for shopping carts, uh, remember that we only have one report, and it's a quite powerful report related to shopping carts in Moya BI. Um, and uh, you, we have plenty of features that we can just drag in into the report in order to analyze the data. Remember that a uh, storage location now it's uh, an item that we want to take a look at it in case that uh, um, because in the shopping cart we. Uh, in case that we have inventory, we have to identify which is the storage location along with the fan center, right? And um, the account assignment is another important field that we will take a look at it. Um, item number as well, because uh, you can, um, let's say, the granularity of the, of the analysis that you can do in the shopping carts, it can be at the header level, or you can include in the analysis the different item numbers within the shopping cart, right? Remember that uh, at the at the end of the day, you are approving the items within a shopping cart, right? So uh, it's important to do an analysis by item as well. Um, then item type will identify whether the line item that you are including in the shopping cart is uh, corresponds to a material or corresponds to a service. So it's a good way to break it down into two categories of elements, services or goods, that's item name. And then uh, the shopping cart number, because at the end of the day, you want, you want to troubleshoot or analyze is, uh, what's going on with a specific number of shopping carts. And uh, you can always identify which is the shopping cart number that you want to take a look in BI. Uh, this is a whole map of different attributes that are on the table right now in the requisitions analysis area. Some of them were available back uh, since 2013, uh, some others uh, like the ones not being in gray. So the ones in gray are old. In the other colors are uh, attributes that have been recently added into the data queue, and uh, mostly related to the ship to address, for example, which in, for some peacekeeping operations it's important. Uh, identifying about the location, in term location as well, the good recipients, a status, and this is one of the most important ones, the status of the shopping cart in terms of uh, who uh, put the status as complete, when was the status set as complete, when um, what the shopping cart, when was created, who did create it, when was put in hold, or when the shopping cart was ordered and by whom, right? So all those things will are now included as well as, uh, for example, the asset main number in case that uh, we are requesting uh, an asset uh, PID starting with 21, for example. 
Okay. So that's uh, for your information, the map of different attributes that you may find in the analysis workspace. Um, then uh, these are just uh, another set of items that we think it's important to do the analysis for requisitions. Uh, these are screenshots of how to log in into, into the Umoja BI portal uh, in case that you don't know how to do it. Okay, and this is the screenshot of the report that we will go through today, right? Remember, requisitions analysis area is already a certified report by the business owner and the subject matter experts in New York. Um, so that's the one we're going to take a look this afternoon. Then uh, some tips before starting, and especially for the ones of you who are not acquainted with the with the reports in general. Um, this is something that uh, I consider quite important at the prompt level, and you'll see how the prompt works. Prompt, it's basically the list of fields that you have to fill in. Some of them are mandatory, some of them are optional, but at the end of the day, you have to fill in some sort of information in order to launch the report. Mm, that information may be a range of dates, because you may want to get the number of shop shopping carts within a certain range of time. Um, the status, for example, of the shopping cart, um, the shopping cart number, the plant, the business area. But at the end of the day, you have in the prompt, which is the initial window when you start to key in the initial information, at the prompt level, it's important that if you are not very familiar with the report itself, right? So it, it, if it is going to be one of the first times that you're going to launch this report or any BI report, um, or if you're not so sure of what you're looking for, right? It's just um, you're just trying to see and understand how the report looks like. Our recommendation, if you are in one of these two items or uh, if you are uh, one of those in those two situations, you fill in the least number of fields in the prompt and you'll see why. So the idea is not to input a lot of data before launching the report because otherwise you're going to lose a bit of perspective of the whole reality in at the shopping cart level. Okay, now focusing on the requisitions analysis area. And as a good practice, especially for beginners, and I don't want to get really philosophical here, but I think it's important to understand the different levels in reporting in general. At the prompt level, you have, let's say, a universe of data that you can use, right? We were talking about before it was a business area. You can include a business area, a plant, a purchasing group, a range of shopping carts, uh, approvers. You set it initially a prompt, and then you will get a report, okay? What we call that piece of reality, okay? In the report itself there, you can actually filter by different categories of elements. So that means that if you did not filter in the initial prompt, you have a quite large piece of reality. And from that quite large piece of reality, you will be able to filter in by different attributes. And uh, I'm uh, identifying these attributes like the, all these different squares with colors, right? And from there, you, all, you, you only get this piece of reality, okay, coming from an initial prompt, which was almost empty, and from there, you do your analysis, okay? So you start big, you do your housekeeping in the report, and then you think about the results that you have gotten, okay? So uh, as I said, I don't want to get very philosophical, but I think uh, that the message um, um, is clear, that uh, especially, as I said, for beginners, uh, start big with uh, a prompt, not really with a lot of data. And once you get your report, then you work it out a little bit and then you do an analysis. Because on the contrary, if you start to put a lot of fields in the prompt, right? And then you launch your report, that report may look like this, right? Uh, you have the same set of data, but uh, somehow you have lost a little bit of reality, right? Because uh, there are plenty of other uh, data that you have not taken into account because you put a lot of things in the prompt. So the reality over here may be a bit biased. So you're starting small, you get a smaller piece of reality, and then the results and the analysis may be a bit biased by the initial 
data in the prompt. So uh, hopefully that's that's uh, clear. If not, please uh, let me know, and uh, because we will jump directly into the system. But uh, you know, as a as a rule of thumb or the golden rule here in in uh, BI, especially for beginners, just start big, meaning with all the data that you can in the report, and in the report itself, start to filter, start to um, order or to sort, start to create visuals, start to um, make your calculations, and then from there you do your analysis. Okay, that's uh, the main point from this uh, presentation that I want to convey, right? So, uh, as I said, fill in the least number of fields, and uh, this is the prompt. This is a famous prompt. When you launch a report, you will see in this particular case for requisitions analysis area, this is the initial prompt. Blank, right? You have a set of uh, required fields. You have a set of optional fields. And these are all the fields that you can initially input in the, your report for shopping carts in BI. Uh, this is at the level of the T-code. In ECC, in the T-code, um, remember when Brian was uh, doing VL uh, 06i uh, with a list of inbound deliveries, he just put the PO number, right? Or he removed the PO number and he just put a range of dates. Okay, so this is the same level as the prompt in BI. So in a T code, the first uh, master data elements that you input there in order to execute that T code are the uh, data that you are including in the prompt in BI. So this is the example as per uh, requisitions analysis area, and we'll go through that. Uh, then I want to drag your attention to this um, checkbox on the bottom left corner, the save prompt values with workspace. This is important always to check that one because um, a good practice is always to, it's, it's good to launch your report and save your report for future analysis, right? Or for reference or to create a template of report. Only if you click here, saving your prompt values with the workspace, you will be able to save all your initial prompt uh, without a problem, right? So always a good practice to check this at the prompt level. And then when you're okay, checking over here and identifying one of these fields, you can click on okay and then you'll see the report, okay? Um, a report may look like this, okay? So once you have launched uh, the prompt, then a report may look like this. And in this particular level, once you have all the data there, then you have to work out and use your navigation skills in order to understand how the reality looks like from the requisitions point of view. Okay, so first the prompt, then when you launch, you get your report. All right, hope that's clear. Uh, because in the initial prompt over here, in the initial prompt, the initial um, uh, stage of the of the reporting in BI. Basically, in the, in the requisition, requisition, requisition part in the shopping cart area, you basically are going to play with the date range of creations of shopping carts. You may include a range of dates or months or a year. There you have some inventory parameters like a plant or storage location, for example, and some other master data elements like fund, business area, fund center, and purchasing group, right? All are over here, right? Even account assignment category. And from here, you get your report initial. Okay, so uh, besides that, there are more things uh, in the um, to go through in the presentation. But I think we only have four or five minutes left, and it's important just to go uh, directly into intro production if uh, it's okay with you. So I'm going to link into the system, and uh, I'm going to double check with Brian in case that we have any comments or questions. Over to you, Brian. <laughs> No, Daniel, no, nothing in the chat except for an, uh, a congratulations from Jawad on the approach that you're taking for uh, for BI. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. That's uh, for me. These two slides are really important, right? Uh, start big, do your housekeeping, and then think, rather than you know uh, start to fill in on all the information. So let's go to BI, and we'll do as. I said, as you can see in the slides, we will do launching the reporting shopping carts. So this is uh, my BI Launchpad. Always the home page uh, is the same. As we told you uh, yesterday, 
we were going to look during this week in the source to acquire folder, BI23 role, and uh, most more specifically to these seven reports, uh, 35 reports by the business owners. So today we're going to go to the requisitions analysis area over here. So I double click. And I will I will be seeing now the prompt. So the prompt loads, and then you have to start to do an initial filtering of the of the information. Okay, in the prompt. So this is what you get. The same thing that you see, that you saw before in the presentation. So uh, here we have all the possibilities of the world to start analyzing shopping carts, right? Uh, for me, it just uh, is not the best. I'm not saying this is the best one, but what I did is. Uh, I tried to identify several fund centers, right? So, uh, because this is as an excuse to show to you how the prompt works and how to use all these different uh, functions in the prompt. So what I'm going to do, it's um, first, I'm going to select all the fund centers for the United Nations office in Vienna, for example, UNOV. So in order to identify the fund centers for Vienna, I will have to go to the match code over here. And then I will have a series of all fan centers included in the UN. So I'm scrolling down and uh, there are thousands of fan centers, right? So how I identify the ones only for UNOF. So a way to do that, besides clicking one and the other and scrolling and possibly it lasts, and that's gonna last a couple of hours. You can always go to this uh, like free text bar and you can identify the UNOV text as a text and always click on these binoculars, but please bear, bear in mind that you have here a black arrow. You click there and you search in text because UNOV, it's a text. Uh, remember that you have a text over here close to a member key. You see all the fan centers in Umoya have uh, usually five digits. So you can look for those digits by, click, by searching in key or on the contrary, you can look for the fan center text, but you have to tell the binoculars where to find either the number or on the contrary, the text. It's easier to go for the text because I don't know exactly, you know, the numbers for these UNOP fan centers, right? So then now that I have identified my text and it's UNOV, I click on the binoculars and the system will highlight in yellow all the fan centers linked to UNOF. So I can click all of them. Oh, excuse me. So I can click the first one, go into the last one, and click on Shift in my keyboard. I'm selecting all of them in one shot. Let's see if it works. Let's see. It's going to work over here. OK. So all of them are selected. And then I click in OK. So I'm not only selecting one fan center, I'm selecting probably 15 or 12 fan centers linked to the United Nations office in Vienna. OK, so if I click in OK over here, I will see shopping carts as of today, right? Because the report is prompted as of today, 19th of May 2020. Um, and then I'm going to click on save prompt values with the workspace because eventually I will save this report. So let me click in OK. So I just put all the fan center. OK, I just want to know only the fan centers for UNOP. The rest about creation, the dates, funds, business area, functional area. You know what? I don't know them very well. I don't know how they work, so I'm not going to fill in anything. Why? Because I am a beginner and I want to start big with a lot of data in my report. And from there, I will start cleaning up my report. So I click in OK. So this is, we're going now from the prompt level to the report per se. So the level one to the level two. We're going from the prompt to the report itself over here. So depending on the report, this may take 30 seconds, 20 seconds, one minute, and your bandwidth as well. Usually reporting analysis uh, area is not, uh, it's actually one of the best that uh, they have the best performance, but um, we'll see. Because this morning was actually behaving very well. Today we'll see in the afternoon. 
All right, so that's the report. And uh, don't be overwhelmed about the, all these different boxes here if this is the first time. Once you understand the rationale behind and a little bit how to navigate, I'm not saying that you're going to uh, like it, but you're going to understand it right away. Um, and on top of that, for me, um, the way to work with these all attributes and the way their report responds and the layout changes, it's really compelling because uh, you really start digging in and drilling down into particular fields and you really can do a you know, good piece of analysis with all these data. So first, let me take a look at the analysis one. This is the report itself. The other two, let's say, columns with these uh, boxes, rows, columns, background, all those things are, let's say, uh, features that are within this report that you can use based on, based on your knowledge. But the report itself, it's this analysis, this, let's say, box, big, big box on the right side, right? What I can see here is that I have a list of purchasing groups with the number and the text, and a breakdown by count of shopping carts, the different items, the quantity, and if I scroll to my right, different net values in local currency, average item quality order, and stuff like that. So let me go back to the slide here. Now I'm going to do my housekeeping, right? I started big with a lot of data, only inserting fund centers, you knew enough. And then I'm going to do my housekeeping. How I do that? Okay, the measures here, which are the different numbers, as you can see in the right side, these are the measures, always numbers. If you double click over there, you'll see the list of columns eventually that you have in the measures. You have all of them ticked as, except net price in shopping cart currency. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to select only two. So I'm unselecting all of them and only selecting count of shopping carts and net value local currency, which local currency in the system means US dollars. And I click in OK. Why? Because I'm a bit overwhelmed. This is the first time that I see this report and I don't want to see 15 different columns on top of these, these two uh, columns in the attributes. I just want to you know, clean up a little bit the report to start understanding what all this it's about. It's about counting of shopping carts and net value local currency by purchasing group. But remember that in the prompt, we identified fund centers for Vienna. So all these data comes from shopping carts linked to fund centers in UNOF. A way to know that is to go to prompt. If, you, if I click to the prompt button over here, see it works. Once you click in the prompt, you'll see the initial prompt that you input initially. Okay, now I don't know when it's, okay, here we go. You see, I only put the fund centers for Vienna, nothing else. If I want to change and put some data in terms of dates or funds, I can do that. But a way for me to check what was my initial prompt, how my initial prompt looked like, it's to click here on prompt. I cancel and I continue with my report. Okay, hope that's clear. Um, what we can do here, a bit of uh, more housekeeping. Um, here, I think it's a bit redundant and important to understand that uh, uh, every time that you launch this an an requisitions analysis area, every single time, you will have these two items present in the report initially. The purchasing group number and the description. This uh, five zero number with the text on the side, always. That's, let's say, the defaulted layout of the shopping cart analysis area. Uh, a way to change it, it's a way to, it's uh, by dragging and dropping different items into the report as we will, uh, as we will do in a minute. It's taking a bit of time with the prompt. I don't know why. But uh, just, uh, and I'm going to go back to the presentation. Very mind that every single time that you launch these reports, let me see how it is over here. Let me put it bigger. You'll see the purchasing group in number with the text. Okay, and from here, you will start building and creating the new report. Okay, still processing, that's not good news. Let me see if I can go to one of uh, the reports that I saved before in my documents. Let's 
see if I can go to my wave Wi-Fi. Okay, that's better. Brian, uh, still there, but yes, I, I have mm -hmm. problems with the, my bandwidth somehow. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, we're still here. The chat was a bit quiet for a while, and then uh, suddenly there was a couple of uh, comments. So uh, Maria Jose was asking about the local currency is always in US dollars. Yes. And you immediately answered that as she was typing it in the chat. So we left it at that. And then uh, uh, Georgios is talking about the measures are automatically generated. Okay, meaning the categories. So what I'm understanding from this is the uh, the objects inside the measures that are displayed. Correct? The options that you have under the measures uh, filter in the report and i was explaining that the the reports even if they're aws or, or web intelligence reports are usually intended to provide a specific type of information right so you will have a, a series of uh, measures already established in the report you can then filter and display different types of measures but the ones that are there available are defaulted because these uh, these reports are intended to show uh, KPIs, specific KPIs, or are created for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the question was going. Uh, okay, and uh, Georgios has responded clear, so I think we're okay with that as well. Mm -hmm. And if you're having trouble, uh, I can try from my side. Yeah, if you could, uh, in the meantime, uh, log in, and then in case that I'm experiencing some problems, I can. Uh, you can t take over, and I can explain from your. Okay. From your reports. But definitely doesn't look promising. This morning was doing just great. And I don't know if it's me or if it's some, some maintenance that they are uh, doing in, in BI right now. As far as my experience goes, every time uh, hours between Europe and, and the US collide, uh, the system acts up. You never know if they're doing some sort of maintenance. Or, or the server connection, but usually around this time, 3, 30, 4 o'clock is where you can encounter issues like you're encountering now, or the system is slower. But I'm trying by, from my side anyway, and I'll let you know how it goes. Okay. Because otherwise I will go back to the presentation and uh, although the good, uh, I mean the report that I had at least saved for you, um we will you know analyze all the different uh, uh, aspects of the shopping cart from let's say the inventory side so the idea was to basically identify all the storage locations from all the shopping carts for a particular let's say entity let's call it uh, for example you know uh from there what we will do is we will identify which storage locations have not been filled in in the initial shopping cart okay and uh, filter that specific range of uh, of shopping carts and from there we will do an analysis of why this uh, uh, storage location was not filled in initially maybe because it was a service so we can take out of the service and then from the goods and materials that were in the shopping cart without the storage location the idea is to identify why the storage location was not uh, properly filled in initially right so uh, and that's a bit of the idea behind the analysis that I want to perform today, but uh, doesn't okay. look. It's working from my end. Oh, good. It's working. It seems to be working fine from my end. At least the prompt is already available. Okay. I'm just not sure what data you've added in each field. Don't worry. I can just tell you. And uh, here, let me share mine instead. Okay. In that case, I will log in initially. Let's see. Okay, perfect. So um, we're in the requisitions analysis area. Thank you, Brian. Uh, the idea is to go to fan centers over here and uh, identify in the match code all the fan centers linked to, for example, UNOP. So what I did is I put UNOP and I look for text. We're talking about UNOG with a G? No, with B. With B. Wait, sorry, UNOP. Okay. And of course, we selected text. No. B of Vienna. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right. 
be right. loaded, as they say in England. So, uh, yeah. exactly. So we can select the first one, go all the way to the bottom with mm -hmm. ship and select uh, all the range of, uh, of fan centers. Okay. So uh, besides that, we will save the prompt values on the okay. left panel exactly, and then we click OK and launch our report. That's it. The date's fine in the fund. OK, yep. with, with no yep. data. All right. Perfect. No data. Well, let's launch that. In the meantime, let me log out of Citrix and uh, see whether there's a problem with uh, with Citrix as well from my side. All right. Well, we more or less we have said where um, my system stopped at some point ten minutes ago. All right. So uh, what I did, site filter, you see that the, as George just uh, asked, automatically all the numbers that you see measures of these, these columns, count of shopping carts up until average, average item price, all these are numbers. And measures mm -hmm. will always be numbers, okay? Yes. Then attributes like SRM purchasing group or the text will be mm -hmm. called attributes. So okay. if we just filter measures by double click on measures and just come up with two columns. Um, we deselect everything. And we only select count of shopping carts and net value local currency. Why? Because we want to know just the numbers of the shopping carts and then its value in local currency. We click on OK and then our uh, report looks a little bit, uh, you know, uh, smaller, easier to read. Let's let's uh, call it like that. OK, then uh, Brian, if you Click on the, let's say, blue cube on the left side. OK, that will give you access to the different attributes that you can find in your report. OK, you have information related to location, to the product ID, ship to address. You have uh, there are a trillion number of, uh, of attributes that you can use. Uh, for the moment, I would like to use the dates related to a year. So uh, I think. Uh, if you go to the D, because it's sorted in alphabetical order. Okay. Uh, sorry, I was using the uh, field for finding. Exactly. Uh, if maybe. Uh, put Control F, and then when you put Control F, you'll see the different uh, matches, the date. Perfect. So, what there we can see date created on, for example, of the year. So there is date SC created on year. Okay. That's the one you want to use, and you just drag it to the rows. Perfect. So now the 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 report on the right panel will be enriched with the different creation, the year creation of all the shopping carts. Remember, for the fund centers in enough. Let's say that you know the SRM purchasing group for us is not so important, so we can remove both elements out of our analysis right now. So we. Brian is going to track that one and put it on the left panel and the other one as well. So we may expect after he does the second dragging off to have a breakdown of all the shopping carts created in UNOV since 2015. You see, by dragging in the date of the shopping cart created year, and taking the other two attributes out, our report now, it's easier to read. You have a breakdown of all the shopping carts created since 2015 up until now. So uh, just a way to visualize this data and create a pie chart, it's a matter of going to insert. There is a tab on the right uh, on the navigational menu on the top, insert, where you have all the visuals that you can insert into your report. It's as easy as clicking on the pie chart icon. And the system understands that you want to create a pie chart out of this analysis. So you'll see automatically two pie charts. Why? 
You see two pie charts because you have the breakdown of the years, but you have two columns, two measures, one with the count and the other with the net value local currency. So the system understands that you want to break down by year a count of shopping carts and a, and a net value in shopping carts. And you see that the, it's, it's funny because the two pie charts look alike, more or less, right? More or less, they look alike. So there is some sort of, a, uh, uh, let's say, correspondence between the number of shopping carts and the net value local currency of those shopping carts. Okay, so you have two pie charts with percentages of count and net value local currency. So as easy as clicking on the pie chart in insert, you will be able to uh, create a visual of the data. And uh, this is specifically, it's, it's very important once you have uh, one or two columns and just one or two attributes, meaning you have two measures and then one or two attributes dragging in the, in the rows. Otherwise, the pie chart will be very, let's say, scattered within different combinations of uh, items and columns. So you, it's a, a good tip is always to um, uh, make visuals with uh, not, not a lot of information in your analysis. You know, with a very simple type of report, you will, you will be able to launch and create pie charts or columns as you need. Um, so a way just to create a visual as one of the main points in the survey initially that you responded initially. Uh, most of you were not able or didn't know how to create a visual in BI. It's just a matter of clicking on this insert tab. You have there a variety of options like a line chart, pie chart, or even cluster columns and other charts. Okay. So if you want to get rid of that chart, you just click on that uh, analysis or sub-analysis that created because you can always click again to the pie chart and have your analysis there. So you click on that X and the analysis comes as originally was there. So let's say that we want to focus our, our attention only in 2019, okay? Our, let's say, chief of operations in our requisitioning unit wants to really understand what happened in 2019. So a way to filter in only that year, it's by uh, right-clicking on 2019. So you go to the 2019, you right-click, and thank you, Brian, for understanding while I'm speaking uh, uh, so many years uh, together. I think that we more or less uh, know what we mean. So he, he uh, I'm right trying click. to make it seem like you're still using the mouse on your computer. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So he just right clicked and then he's going to keep members. So the system understands that Brian wants only to keep 2019. The rest are not important. So 2019 is the year that you want to analyze. So now you may expect only one line, 2019, count of shopping carts, and net value local currency. Okay, so it's 237 raised shopping carts with over $10 million raised in UNOF. Remember, it's for Vienna, okay? All right, so um, let's, uh, uh, let's put uh, this date the, the attribute 2019 into the background. And we show you what the, how the background works. Uh, what basically Brian is doing, it's uh, putting in the background the information, meaning that uh, you don't want the, we don't want the date of the creation, this 2019 to be reflected in the analysis. That's why you don't see this 2019 anymore. But it's still, let's see, within the report. It's in the back end. We don't want to drag out that piece of information because it's important, right? 2019. But what we want to do is just put it in the background and use some other attributes in the left panel. Okay. So uh, I think that date of approval. Can you put uh, approval, control F, and see? Data approval. Okay, there. I think that that one that it was highlighted there. System, ch I think it's there. Yeah, select that one and drag it into the rows. So there, what you, what we may expect there is that by dragging the attributes changed on approval, we may have a list of dates when 
the shopping carts in 2019, because it's in the background, were approved. So the system breaks down the count and the net value of the shopping carts by dates. I uh, hope it's, it's, uh, it's clear now. And uh, well, what we can see here is eight shopping carts. They don't have a date. So just first thing that we could do, okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to do it, but first thing that I will write down if I was uh, going to do the analysis for shopping cart is why I have eight shopping carts with no date. So I will, I'm, uh, please don't do it, but I will select that one, okay, and drag and drop the shopping cart number into the rows, take note of those shopping cart numbers and go to, go into SRM and see what's going on, okay? That's a first analysis that you could do, okay? Uh, but what we guys? Yes, uh, so? sorry to interrupt. Uh, Brian, uh, somebody close is asking if you could please enlarge the column of net value, net value in local currency to make it bigger, just to give uh, more space between the two the two columns. But maybe they are not they cannot see properly the values. Yeah, that's that's Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sol. Okay, so uh, basically with that hashtag, we're going to remove it. So we're, uh, Brian is going to select that uh, the first row, right click. And once, uh, because at the end of the day, what you're doing is right clicking and filtering here and remove exactly. So because if we don't know, we just put aside those eight shopping carts, we will take a separate analysis, but we're going to remove the, those ones from our analysis. So I have here a set of dates, okay, and number of counts of shopping carts and net value. Uh, I'm going to sort by date, because you see that the, the date is not being sorted, or yes, can you scroll down? Because maybe it's sorted automatically from 7th of January up until, yeah, looks promising, right? Looks, it's been sorted by year. All right, so it's been sorted. Good. So um, we're going now to create a line chart. Um, if we would follow the same rationale as we did with the pie chart, what Brian would do is to click on the line chart icon in the insert tab. Okay, let's do that. Okay, what do we see here? Okay, what we see here is a list of dates expressed in dots with different colors, as you can see. And then what we can see here is just a kind of like a weird line chart. Just a tip for you. Every time that you create a line chart, it's because usually you want to run a, some sort of trend by date. So, in order to create a good line chart, you have to put the measures, the numbers, the count of the shopping carts at the net value in local currency into the rows and the date itself into the columns. So basically you are going to swap the X and the Y uh, coordinates. So a way to do that is to go to display and swap axes. So this is only applicable for line charts, and especially when you're working with dates. So swap those axes, please. So as you can see, measures will automatically go to the rows, to the rows box. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, in the back end it went, but you saw how the sub-analysis changed. We now have in blue line, a count of shopping carts, and in gray line, the net value local currency by date. But the system, you know, the, the layout here, it doesn't uh, gives you the whole perspective. So Brian, please, can you in the slider, in the in the other, can you, yeah, take it all the way to the right. Thank you. So the system resize the whole thing. So how do you interpret this information here? Okay, you have a range of dates starting in January with basically a count of shopping carts and net value in local currency. Obviously, the measures of the different, let's say, the scale 
encounter a net value is different. That's why you have a blue uh, line there very close to zero and then um, the green line exactly close to, you know, to the net value of thousands of dollars, okay? But uh, just for you to understand it, you, you could uh, automatically see and, and interpret, you know, like uh, things that might not be, um, I don't know, very, or try to understand, trying to um, comprehend in an easy way. Why do I see a peak at the end of the line in 2020? Because if you go to the analysis, Brian, if you go to all the way to the to the bottom, if you scroll down in the analysis in the numbers on the analysis one. Exactly right there. You see the there are dates. You see, you see a couple of there. So in 16th of January 2020, you see 16 shopping carts approved. Remember that we dragged and dropped the uh, shopping cart item change on approval and uh, another one in 22nd of January. So you may want to know why uh, shopping carts that were created in 2019, remember that in the background, we have the 2019 creation, they were approved in 2020. It, had, it may have perfectly sense. I'm not saying that it doesn't have sense. It was probably, uh, you guys have a biannual budget and uh, in B21, you have uh, two fiscal years, which is 19 and 20, okay? But a way to see and understand the approval, the creation of shopping carts, it's by creating these line charts. Uh, we have been using this type of uh, chart uh, with uh, dates of approval, dates of creation in, in the peacekeeping operations, and it's a very um, easy way to identify and pick up some trends or things that wouldn't really make sense, right? I'm not saying that what we what, what we see here doesn't make sense. It, uh, it may have perfectly sense to have a lot of approvals uh, at the beginning of the following year. I'm not saying the contrary. But uh, in peacekeeping operations, what we saw is that a lot of the expenditures was uh, leaning towards the end of the budget cycle. And that's not good at all, because you really want to have a uh, comprehensive and balanced way to uh, exhaust your budget throughout the year and not at the end of the year, right? So um, in terms of requisitionings, uh, I know it's uh, quite a lot, especially if this is the first time that you're seeing this report. But uh, just uh, uh, I want you to just grab two, three main concepts. First of all, that once you have access, um, you will be able to do this in three different in just using the prompt with the fan centers. Okay, that's what we did. We click in okay. And then what we did is we filtered our measures by count of shopping carts and net value local currency. And then we just worked with two attributes. The first one in the background, the shopping cart creation, right? We selected only 2019. And then we are combining that data with the shopping cart approval. You see shopping cart item change approval. So the mm, mm, cross-reference of those two attributes, it's giving us this analysis one. And then what we did, it's to display the information in a line chart. Okay. Um, so uh, in terms of requisition, it's a way, as I said, to identify trends and things that wouldn't really make sense. In terms of dates, you know, this line chart is quite useful. Um, so that's the first of the many demos that I wanted to to show. And uh, maybe it's a good time to take a look at the chat, uh, Brian or Sol, in case that we have any comments or or questions. Okay, Daniel. Yes, I'm taking a look at it now. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, Sol. Sorry, no, no. Uh, no, no. Yes, I was just. Uh, there is a question from Raluca. Is uh, can you have two access, one for count of shopping carts and one for net value in local currency? Exactly. That's a good one. Okay. What we're going to do now, and that's a very good point. Uh, we're going to copy this whole analysis because the good thing, and uh, I'm getting back to one of the questions uh, in the first day. As don't recall the name, but uh, the creation of a template. So the good thing is once you get really acquainted with the BI reporting and you are uh, familiar with the tool and you understand and you like a report that you have just, just created, you can save this report and use this 
as a template that you can share with other colleagues. So let's see that you know this is a really nice report and we want to save it. First, let's save this report. So how do we save a report? Do you see that floppy disk in the navigational menu on the top part? OK, right there. If we click in the floppy disk. OK, right there, save us. OK, uh, Brian is going to save it in his own favorites over there. You can put a file name. You can put uh, shopping carts. Uh, UNOV, for example, 2019. Okay, and you save that report in your own folder, BI folder. So that's private for you. Okay, so it's saved. Now, what we're going to do, you, do you see those sheets? Sheet one, sheet two, sheet three? It's like Excel. So, a way to, let's say, expand your own report, you can copy, okay, the report itself. So, please click on sheet one, uh, Brian. Make sure that this analysis one, it's already, you, you see this bluish square? That means that you have highlighted this report, okay? Now it's been highlighted. Click on copy, please, Brian. The icon copy on the panel, exactly. And then we go to sheet two, and we paste it. So you can break down the information in different sheets, Differ differentiating maybe the counting, maybe net value, maybe years. And you'll see the same analysis with the dates and count on shopping carts. But here, in order to respond to your question, what we're going to do now, it's in one of the sheet, in sheet number one, we're going to have only count of shopping carts. And in sheet number two, we're going to have net value local currency. And then we're going to have two line charts with two different pieces of information in instead of merging the two lines. I'm yeah. crossing my fingers on this one. Okay. Don't worry. Click OK. All right. Okay. All right. So, so mm -hmm. let's uh, let's select this one, the sheet number one, and only have count of shopping carts. You can go to measures or you can right click on as you wish. If uh, Brian clicks, double clicks on measures, he will be able to just remove net value local currency and only have one uh, measure clicked. Okay, so we remove that one, we click in OK. What we may expect is that the sub analysis already. Now it's changed with only the counting, right? So please, in the slider, in the time slider, can you just scroll to the right? Thank you, Brian. So you can see there are a little bit more consistency in terms of counts of shopping carts approved throughout the year. Another story is the net value local currency, right? Well, this here is some peaks, uh, but what you can see there is that uh, sometime in the 30th of uh, December, Right, there is a drop down in terms of number of shopping carts created and approved. Nevertheless, if we go to sheet two, please, Brian, and then we only uh, select net value local currency. Okay, so he's going to go to measures and only select net value local currency. Uh, they are swapped, so you can just select go to net value local current. Oh, yeah, good. So here we have uh, two columns. Then you will have to create the pie chart. So go to insert, exactly, line chart. Sorry, Daniel, I heard pie chart. Ah, sorry, so I clicked no. on that one. Hey, I'm going to just switch it and I can get rid of uh, this guy here. OK, and then that second analysis created, you can swap then. Swap. Uh, well, wait, I'm, I'm just going to make it sure that it shows up on the bottom. Uh, so we're, we're still doing okay. exactly the same thing and then I'll uh, swap it. Only in the graph, right? In the line chart, because mm -hmm. we can always swap the axis on the analysis uh, at the exactly. top too. 
yeah, it's better in the in the analysis in the sub analysis because you can always get rid of it and without changing the the analysis itself. Okay. So a way to break down in two sheets. As you can see there, net value local currency. And can you can you go all the way to the bottom in the in the analysis to see the dates, please? There we go. As you can see here in the 9th of uh, of March, we have almost eighty thousand uh, dollars approved for a shopping cart created in two thousand nineteen. OK, so uh, what we did is to break down this analysis instead of having two line charts, excuse me, one line chart with two lines, one for count and another for net value local currency. We just split it into two different sheets, as you could see. OK, and it's easy as you can copy and paste the whole analysis and do the same thing in the second sheet. OK, so uh, for for uh, in terms of uh, saving the report, although there is an auto save uh, functionality, you can always go to the floppy disk and save it just in case. Because the good thing about this. Uh, sorry, Daniel, uh, just to make sure you want me to override what I saved or save new? No, just save, save. Okay. Yeah, sometimes that's uh, the error message because it clicks an auto auto save. Don't, don't worry. So imagine that you know the, we are perfectly fine with this report, but the good thing about coming up with this template and with this last part that uh, we finished today, but uh, it's important to understand that once you are already um, familiar and comfortable with the report, and once you have saved it, you can always go to the prompt and change the fund centers from UNOF to EUNOC, for example, to Geneva or to uh, ECA or to any other fund center. And you will have the same data, well, same data. You have the same layout with different data. But the good thing is that you created a template. You created a report with two sheets, one with a visual of the approved shopping carts in 2000, um, excuse me, the um, created shopping carts in 2019 and a breakdown of the dates of approval with a line chart by net value and by count in number of shopping carts. So uh, if we go to the prompt in case that it works, uh, Brian, I think you have to go to the blue queue. Uh, yeah, no, I just went back to sheet one because I thought you were talking about that one. <clears throat> Yeah, sometimes it's, yeah, yeah. it's more difficult to explain how it works rather than do it yourself. So go to prompts, exactly. See, it's a bit delayed. So I clicked on it and then I closed it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I think. Right. All right. So remember that the fan centers that uh, Brian inputted before, even at the starting point of fan center. You see the fan centers. Please click on the fan centers again and remove all of them. You can have an analysis instead of the 15 fan centers, you can always come up with one or two and you will have the reflection of that uh, report for only those two fund centers. But what we're going to do now is to select another mission, let's say another entity. Oh, yeah, it's a bit of a pain, but you will get there. Exactly. And you don't see the option to delete them all in one shot. No, no. Okay, and one more to go. And then in the match code, we may do the same thing for uh, Geneva, right? Now that you put Geneva before, you knock. You know, you, you knock with G. Oh, now, now it's, uh, okay, sorry. Sorry, my hearing, I'm hearing impaired right now. Uh, so 
this is what you want? Exactly. Daniel? Okay. Exactly. So uh, select all of them. Click in OK. So we have a list of fan centers instead of for Vienna now for Geneva, right? But the, in the background, the layout and the template is being created before, right? So let's see how the report looks like for Geneva instead of for Vienna. So if we understand correctly what you're saying, once I execute this report, now I'll have the same display of results, but with the data from Vienna. Exactly. For, for Geneva. From now. Geneva, sorry. Because at the end, the, uh, what I want to, the message I want to convey besides all these uh, functionalities and navigational tools is that uh, once you create your own report, and we can say that this is our own report, right? We created this based on our needs with our line chart and our different attributes. Remember, we're just using two, and we have 100 on the left panel, okay? So can, you can only imagine the possibilities of analyzing the data over here, right? So the good thing about coming up with a template that you are comfortable with is just that you can do the same analysis by just going back to the prompt, change the initial uh, set of data, and boom, come up with a report instead of a Vienna for Geneva, right? So uh, that's, uh, I think, one of the main takeaways of uh, today's session, besides the requisitioning part of shop, uh, sh um, shopping cart, is that uh, eventually this analysis workspace and having you access to this data and reports, once you feel comfortable and you understand how it works, you will be able to create your own report and change the layout, excuse me, with a layout that you are feeling comfortable with and then changing the prompt based on your needs, right? Instead of the fan centers, you can have changed from fan center to purchasing group, for example, of a range of shopping carts creation, or for example, a plant, right? So uh, there's a bit of a, the main message I wanted to you know, get across is to understand that the, the possibilities there in terms of anal an analysis are quite big, but the possibilities for you to create your own template and then change the prompt will automatically change the report with new data, and you could compare reports from different fund centers, from different entities, from different purchasing groups within the name, with the same entity, right? And now, you, what you can do now, it's instead of, uh, you can save this report, uh, go into the floppy disk on the, on the black arrow, please, on, on the arrow on the right side, no, the, the, the arrow, the black uh, small arrow on close to the floppy disk. Okay, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm like, I don't see that arrow, yes. Yeah. And save as, so create a, a different uh, report. Okay, uh, sorry. So now uh, we have our file name instead of uh, uh, for UNOV, we will have for UNOV. Mm -hmm. You'll see. So, um, I mean, um, obviously there are plenty of other things that we could do, but uh, I don't want, I didn't want to go through different, uh, you know, going really fast with different demos, as long as you understand first where the report is, which is the role you need, how to work with the prompt. And uh, I can just take over. Thank you very much, Brian, for, it was a big help. Okay, I was just, uh, I don't know if you hear me, I was just showing them that I can pull the reports ah, sorry, uh, yeah. now from, from what I saved, but I think uh, everyone got the idea. Okay, just that because it's 403, I just wanted to... And yeah. so, Sorry guys, we have a, a couple of questions. Yep. Uh, for example, uh, if uh, how do you save it as a template? Can we save this as a template to uh, use it several times when you have to? Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, perfectly, you can take over and then retrieve that report, uh, Brian. Um, okay. Sorry, <laughs> I just Brian. closed it. <laughs> oh, no. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I yeah, thought we were done with that, and, and I, I can and log then, in again. In the meantime, we have a couple of more questions. Maybe I can start uh, reading them. Uh, if it is possible to export the chart as PDF, I guess only the chart. Yes, we can do that. And uh, let me see if it starts right now. Um, the chart, yes, and even in Excel, 
But when you export in Excel anything in, coming from BI, those charts will be exported in um, in uh, as an image. So you can you cannot work it out in Excel anymore. So that's uh, one of the main main improvements in in BI. Let me see if I can just uh, you see my own here. If I go to my yes. documents here, mm -hmm. my inbox. Here I created a folder in my own favorites now for source to acquire T1. Some reports, so we can say that these are templates. OK, you see I created a template for shopping carts for UNO DC, right? So I can double click there. You see the plant is UNO DC. I think it's 83, right? But I, what I could do is I could put ESWA, remove uh, UNODC, and launch the report that I created with the pie chart for um, ESWA instead of UNODC. So, the the good thing it's uh, once you create a report and you save it, you can launch it again, and then you can create a prompt with different. Excuse me, you can fill in the prompt with different parameters and come up with the layout that you feel comfortable with. Now I can go save us. You see, I had my own for you in DC, but what I can do now it's I can put the same name and put. Uh, it's this one. I'm not sure if this is the right acronym. Sorry for that, but I just want to leave it there. So I created another report with SQAP figures, with data from SQAP instead of uh, UNODC. So responding to your question, uh, to the student's question is, once you create your own report, you know how to read it, you feel comfortable with the pie chart, with the numbers over there, you can always save us, change the prompt, and have another template for another mission, for another front center, for another purchasing group, for another set of approvers, for another range of dates, you name it, right? You have plenty of options over here. And you see account, account assignment. Remember the account assignment category was very important in the shopping cart, whether we order a direct material, whether it's a fixed asset, whether we are ordering for a particular project or for a particular call center. Here, we can just drag and drop and break it down only by account assignment. So as you can see, there are plenty of options here. You see assets, code center, direct material for a project, for set C, so that you can break down the whole analysis by different elements on the left panel. And obviously, you can create your own template and change it afterwards for some other element in the prompt. Uh, sorry if it was too fast, but uh, it's already 408 and I didn't want to take most of your time. Uh, any other questions, all or Brian? Of exporting the the chart. Oh, I, I don't you. know if you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, so So the the right button to export it's this one. This is kind of like a disk with an arrow. Export data to Excel. But uh, just click on the options here on the arrow, and you can even export from Excel to PDF. If I export to Excel. You can you see here what I have here is an analysis, which is this table, and a sub-analysis, which is the chart. The system asks you whether you want to export both things or only one. You can select. In this case, I'm going to select the pie chart and the analysis itself. Go and open the file. Good thing about exporting from BI, it's it's quite uh, uh, fast. Doesn't take too much time. And now it's crashing, right? Most probably. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so this is exporting, right? So two things, and thank you for that question because this brings me to the other like golden rule in BI. First, whatever you export, it doesn't export the um, totals or the formulas. So for example, let me go back to the Excuse me, to the to BI. Let's see if I can see it. And Excel. Here we go. Um, 
let's see if I insert here a subtotal. I right click on 2019, for example, totals, show totals. So I'm going to have a subtotals by year over here. Oh, excuse me, uh, and a big total result at the end. OK, so this is all counts of shopping carts, all counts of net value local currency. I export to Excel again. Both items. You see, the result has been exported, but in Excel, it's a number. It's not a formula. And this is very, very important because sometimes we saw analysis that wouldn't really make sense because people would took by for granted that this was a formula. And you could change this 11 could be a 123. And you see this 3,923 uh, total of shopping carts hasn't changed because it's not a formula. So let me go back to 11. So what usually what you should do is to create the formula again. I see. I don't know why it's changed. Let me see here. You create the formula again, and then you can work in Excel. OK, that's for analysis one. For the sub-analysis one, you go in the other sheet. You'll see this is what you get. Not very promising, right? It's a, an image of the pie chart. At the same will occur in PDF. It's just an image that you can just enlarge, you can shrink, that you can just uh, you know change the layout a little bit, but you cannot work out with the numbers over here. So golden rule. You export to Excel, no formulas are exported, so you have to redo again. And the sub analysis, pie charts, visuals, line charts are just images. So if I do the same thing, excuse me, and I do it uh, in PDF, instead of Excel, I select PDF. OK, those are the different options. It's OK. This is what you're going to get. You're going to get a, uh, let's see, a table, the initial table with the breakdown of the creation by year with account assignments, and then the image of the pie chart, nothing else. And then at the end of the day, the prompt that you used. Remember that I changed the plan. Now it's SQUAP instead of UNODC. So exporting options, OK. Well, not the best that you can find in the market, obviously, but at least there is an option to export. And usually the Excel part works very well. If you know beforehand, of course, that the image is there instead of a pie chart and that the formulas are not exported neither. Over uh, to you. Uh, so. so, sorry, yeah, we have, sorry, my apologies to Raluca because I missed uh, one question. The question is uh, whether we can have one chart with two a y axis like in excel instead of having two separate charts mm, i'm not sure if i'm getting that one i am not sure either maybe raluca maybe can you you can maybe can you have one chart with it's two at axis? the very end it's at the very end of the chart uh danny because yeah, at the so. very end it, it yeah it's yeah. already written Raluca, you could just, uh, I mean, you can just uh, drop a, a, an offline message and then we get back to you on that. But uh, definitely, as long as you can change and swap the axis, you can uh, really uh, do plenty of things in terms of, uh, you know, changing the axis and the scale. Uh, uh, but uh, please, can you uh, offline, you drop a message and then we will try to give you an answer to that. Um, for the rest, uh, um, um, hopefully it was clear, at least, you know, from the presentation point of view with the with the tips and the approach in order to start, uh, you know. Uh, Sorry. Sorry, Daniel. Uh, yes, uh, we just uh, skipped. Uh, uh, Hasim has also um, made a comment there. I don't know if, if Sol realized it, uh, but there was something on the data that BI is displaying, right? So we're talking about SRM data. We're talking about ECC data. 
But the question, I think, if I understand it correctly, is related to data from IMIS. If for that IMIS. can be this. Yeah, for IMIS, you got data, but it's for budget, right? So uh, there you have to go to the folder, no in search to acquire, you will have to go to finance, uh, fund management, and there you do have in historical peacekeeping operations and some management, fund management analysis data, you have IMIS information, yes, from previous years, but not in the source to acquire folder. If, to the best of my knowledge, IMIS data, it's more related to uh, budget rather than source to acquire. Thanks, uh, thanks, Daniel. I think that's the last of the questions on the chat. I do see a raised hand yeah. from Shokida. If you wish to speak up, Shokida. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. Uh, yeah, good afternoon again. I, I spent a lot of time to uh, de uh, generate the report uh, for all uh, purchase orders created according to the our cost center. I meaning I need the report. Uh, for the amount for the low value amount uh, uh, and uh, from zero until uh, 10,000 and above. And by uh, creating the reports, I cannot receive, uh, cannot see the reports for all low value purchase orders. Uh, could you please advise or could you please show? Um, I don't know, um, maybe I do some mistake because I go to the you know, this you know including low value purchase orders, but anyway, it doesn't show me the report for all low value purchase orders. It shows me the low, uh, it shows me only purchase orders above the 40,000. Okay, so well, well, we, can do, we can take that question offline or maybe we can just address it at the end of the week when we go through the PO uh, analysis area and the reports in the I for POs. Because today was more, uh, it was solely for, for shopping carts, but definitely you can just uh, sh shoot me a message and I can just uh, retrieve it from there in case that you need a, an answer right now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, obviously we could do more, we could do more demos, but I think the, at least the point was there, how to uh, retrieve the data, how to work a little bit with the prompts, and especially if it is the first time that you're going to work with uh, these type of reports, you know, start big, not with a lot of data in the prompt, and then do the, your housekeeping in the report level when you have the numbers, and from there try to do the analysis. That's uh, a bit of the main idea of today's, and will be applicable for all the Moja BI reports, regardless the even the business process. So, and I left uh, Brian the the survey for today's uh, afternoon session as well in the chat. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Uh, th thank you for for the great session in BI. Thank you guys for your questions. Thanks all for jumping in in the chat when I was uh, sharing my screen. I didn't realize that we'd had uh, comments on the chat. Please take oh, two minutes to answer the survey uh, that Daniel has just shared in the chat. I think it's it's worth it for us to see. Uh, what you got from this uh, BI session and, and how you feel after this afternoon session, uh, a combination between uh, BI and also a bit more on the shopping cart for goods uh, raised for inventory. I know it was a, a, a session full of information. There's going to be also a lot of documents shared this afternoon in an email with attachments and so on. Again, we're recording this session. We'll share that recording with you as well. And uh, uh, after that, that's it. That's the end of this session in the afternoon. We're 20 minutes past the hour, but as long as you guys uh, are eager to receive more information, we're here to provide it. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the sessions and uh, enjoy your afternoon.